Okay. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, nice to meet you virtually, I would say. Uh, it's a bit strange not to, to see you because we are inside of a Zoom conversation, but I know you are uh, quite a lot on the uh, on the chat, so don't hesitate to, to react, to, to, to say hi, or to ask questions as soon as we start. Um, first of all, I want to, to thank the organizers uh, for yeah, allowing us to, to have this conversation live and to speak about, about this uh, very interesting topic, which is uh, board games in intercultural and social work context. So it's a quite large topic. And maybe uh, to, to explain why we are beginning to talk about it, I have to say a few words about the project which we are running um, together with Jean-Emmanuel Barbier, who is uh, there too, and uh, Virginie Tac as well, but also with other colleagues from uh, the Haute École de la Ville de Liège, so uh, university, a technical university in Liège, and the HE2B, Haute École Bruxelles-Brabant, another technical university, but in Brussels. Uh, our other colleagues who are not there today uh, Alexis Messina, Jérôme Foguen, and Anne-Catherine Vieux-Jean, and they also participated in creating this, this uh, beautiful session. Uh, so we are um, running a project together, as I said, and this, this project is called Emprageux, or uh, in other words, Faire Société, which is quite un untranslatable, because uh, in French, we, we call uh, board games Jeu de Société, which means like society games. Uh, and the society building aspect is actually one of the, uh, of the very important sides of our project of Emprageux, because we try to, to study how people in uh, social work, in cultural work, in youth work, are using uh, board games, tabletop games in their professional activities. Um, of course, uh, the, the uh, broad topic of the, this Bradley tabletop game uh, game symposium, which is called uh, Zones of Connection, is also connected to that topic because we, we are uh, in fact investigating how professionals connect with various, uh, various audiences uh, using um, board games. Um, I have to say as well that our project is financed by uh, our, the Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, uh, and financed by uh, a funding which is called FRHE, and it's the first funding in Belgium um, for technical universities. So we are quite uh, proud to, to have it, and uh, we want to, to share our gratitude about it. Um, so this exploratory story, uh, study of board game practices, uh, we uh, run it in social cultural animation and social cultural in, uh, intervention. And what we do, we conduct uh, semi directive, uh, so semi structured interviews with actors in the field. And we try to see how, why, and in which manner maybe they use um, uh, board games. So uh, I think I've said enough about the project. Um, and uh, Jean-Emmanuel is going to say a few words about uh, the other speakers today. Yeah, because uh, for this uh, conference, we decided to invite some people from other perspective than just the Benjamin field. And so we have with, with us uh, Yannick de Platz, uh, who is um, associate professor at the French Department of Nagoya University of Foreign Studies. Uh, he's also well known among obese gamers for uh, the critics he produced of Japanese board games and his implication to in that uh, uh, field. Uh, he received a, a, a Geek of the Week award in the board game Geek uh, uh, forum, so that's one uh, that's one criterion uh, if you want. And we have also with us Melissa Rogerson, uh, which is a lecturer at the uh, I'm sorry, lecturer at the School of Computing and Information System at the University of Melbourne, where she completed her PhD on obese board gamer community. So she was also well versed in uh, what's happened among these uh, groups of population, this community. 
uh, how research interests include both game studies and human computer interaction. And we should have with us uh, Rabin Lomami, which is an independent journalist and graduate in graphic arts, uh, architecture design, and also, um, sorry, I'm losing. Uh, um, sorry, he's also an uh, independent journalist. Uh, but he's more importantly, is a member of the Communauté Africaine des Ludothèques, uh, so commun African community of the toy librarian. And he tried to develop the use of pedagogical games in education and the installation of uh, game library in Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, and also in that context, he created some educational games. Uh, he's not yet here yet. We hope we can uh, connect uh, with us uh, through Zoom. Uh, he has some technical difficulties, so we hope he will be able to join later. Uh, so, and that's it. So as you can see, we have a wide array of uh, various reason and um, uh, various continents. And we hope that uh, we will be able to engage a discussion uh, with us various elements. And on top of that, with also you on the Twitch chat. Uh, and I will uh, give the power back to Bruno. We will explain how we will function here. Of course, of course. So a uh, very short explanation uh, of how, how the discussion is going to take place. So uh, we will speak for about an hour. Uh, the topic is quite large, um, so uh, we have selected a series of uh, text uh, and image snippets, so like fragments, relating to different aspects of the issues. We call them uh, elicitation probes, but it just means fragments uh, which can be commented by uh, the participants in this uh, in this uh, round table, but also by people in the chat. It means uh, uh, that we will have uh, for each probe a short round of discussion. I will try to distribute the floor to to all speakers, which does not uh, which uh, does not mean that everyone is required to speak during each round. So, if you feel like like speaking. You can uh, uh, attract my attention, and I will give you I will give you the floor. And for participants in the chat, I said there is the possibility to comment on the debate or to propose elicitation probes uh, themselves. Um, there is a moderator in the chat will pass us uh, your your reactions so that we can uh, discuss them. You can use um, the word comment or probe at the beginning of your post. So if you want to post a comment, just write comment uh, at the beginning. And if you want to uh, use a probe uh, to um, pass uh, a probe, then write probe at the beginning so that we know how to handle your, uh, your writings. And uh, Jean-Emmanuel will show you an example on the screen, I think. Oh, he's uh, yeah, already doing it. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't seeing the screen. So okay, we, it's a, yeah, uh, a last one. Maybe it is possible that we uh, that we cannot uh, go through all the probes because we just have one hour, and that's also the reason why we we're gonna start soon. Yeah, I was about saying. Let's start with the first probe we prepared. So. We want to react first to this uh, assembly of pictures, how they interpret that, uh, if, they if that suggests something to them, or if there are, there are some ide ideas. If not, maybe I will start to show. So the picture we assembled were uh, selected because it's a lot of various forms of games. You have the Monopoly, which is well known, well uh, present. Everyone knows what Monopoly is. Uh, so I, I will cut short the presentation here. You have traditional uh, games on a corner on the top uh, right. On the bottom left, you have, we speak about board games, but on the bottom left, you have board games, but it's only cards. There is no board, so why board games? And on the center, we have uh, various forms of games. So the idea is that there is a diversity, which is a difficulty uh, to speak about board games, but because uh, what do you mean when we talk about board games? So if someone wants to continue the discussion or, or on that note, or I can continue uh, to. Oh, I'll add something. Um... My, my children are kind of 
young adults now. But when my older daughter was very young, she was about seven or eight years old, um, she used to go to school and say, oh, my family really love board games. We have lots of board games. And she came home one day and she said, nobody believes that we play board games at home. And we said, oh, you know, that's a strange thing. Why is that? She said, well, I've never played Monopoly. And she actually, from growing up in a house that's literally filled with games, we hadn't played a lot of those kind of older games or more, more um, mass market games that her friends expected her to know. And I thought that was a really interesting, uh, it revealed something about what other people think games look like and what they think that people who play games must know about games and do with games. Uh, does someone want to to react on that? Uh, I see yeah. Yannick nodding. <laughs> yes, because uh, I have about the same experience as Melissa had with uh, children because my daughter uh, is playing a lot of board games with us since she was very, very, very young. And every time she talks about board games with her friends, nobody first, they don't know exactly what board games are. And the uh, other comment she gets a lot is that... Um, all her friends are always asking if she plays Uno, which is a game that's very popular here. And the other one is the game of life. Uh, we call that Jinsei game here. It's been around for a very, very long time. Everybody's got a copy at home, like we have monopolies uh, in Europe, for example. And so exactly the same kind of experience, like her friends can't compute what board games are in her mind because they don't play the same kind of board games and they don't have the same um, image of what a, a board game is supposed to be. And that's very interesting to see how different perception can be about a single word that seems to be very easy to understand at first. And yet, no, not at all. Yeah, so that was funny to hear the same kind of story. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Manuel. So just maybe to add to that, it's really interesting because uh, so, so the base game Monopoly, you know, uh, etc. are also when you study the OBS, so I have studied the OBS during my PhD, uh, and they often use them as uh, um, negative figure. Uh, to, to speak about, oh, this is not a game. What is not a game? This is, Monopoly is not a good game. It's, a, it's a, an example of a bad game, bad, badly designed game. Uh, so it's really interesting because uh, when we, um, we expect when we are, we are studying so social worker that they will be uh, opposed to this different various uh, vision of what a game is and what a board game is more exactly. And uh, so it's really interesting to see that, uh, especially in children, it's also a representation of, oh, you, know, you don't play board game because you don't play Monopoly. So it's something we didn't, ex uh, we didn't have uh, any um, idea that it could be figured. But since for youth people, it's also very present, I think we will really, have to take notes on, on that. I don't know if Bruno wants to react to that or... So I... I commented over in the chat, hoping to stir up some people to start ch chatting over there, that I teach uh, card games. I teach people how to teach board games and card games. And if I have a card game player who's very fluent in card games, making them stop and explain what a trick-taking game is often flummoxes them because it's a core competency. It is a, they've been playing card games since they were four. What do you mean you don't know what it means to take a trick? Wait, what do you mean you don't understand what Trump is? And there is a moment of just consternation and a little bit of vertigo for them when they realize that there are people who don't understand what that means and that they have to actually put this thing into words that they take for granted. Yes, uh, uh, maybe I've had, to, yeah. Sorry, I've had exactly ahead. that experience many times, yes. Yeah, especially with a trick-taking game because explaining how a trick works it's not that difficult, but uh, getting used to be uh, able to play tricks in a clever manner, to be able to actually win tricks and uh, handle the, the, the hand of cards that you, you, were deal you were dealt is a very difficult thing, especially for people who are not used to that. So there's a big difference in, in my opinion 
between how rules just play a card, someone is going to play a card after you. At the end of everybody playing a card, someone wins the trick. That's very simple. Just a, a few words to explain how the mechanics work, but being able to actually play it in a good way and being good at it is very, very difficult. Yeah, that's a very good, very good choice. I think it may be uh, bleeding into the next, uh, the next probe. So I think I will switch to the next one. Uh, oh no, it's not. Uh... I messed up the other, but it still works. So I will let uh, Yannick explain a bit this one and we will go back to the subject we were talking about uh, on the next one again. But let's focus on this one first. So Yannick, can you explain a bit what uh, the probes you, you send us? Yeah, I was uh, trying to, uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, board game cafes phenomenon we have here in Japan for, we have had it in, in, uh, for the last four or five years. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a quote from Twitter from a, a very famous website here, the Japanese BGG, way smaller, but um, that tries to keep track of all the new uh, board game cafes that open here and there in Japan. And over the five, the, the last, the, the past five years, I think uh, you can see the number up there. There's uh, 461 board game cafes, and I guess that. Uh, I would say that five years ago, there was less than 100. And all of a sudden, everybody is trying to open a new store. It's very easy to open stores in Japan. But still, uh, being able to keep it and uh, make it viable economically is a very big challenge. And yet, there's a lot of new uh, board game cafes opening here and there. Because there's, um, I noticed that um, uh, I need to, to give some context here, but uh, usually people playing board games in Japan are people who are very passionate about board games and not very inclusive. And they go to Tokyo's game markets to buy new games, a lot of games. Uh, it's twice a year, every year. And um, for the last three or four years, a new audience is trying to discover the board games and mostly party games, very simple rules, very um, leaning toward the, the funny kind of board games. And there's some kind of clash between those two audiences because the people who are used to playing games don't go to board game cafes. Like every time I go in a board game cafe, I feel very out of place because first I'm way too old compared to the, the youngsters that go there. It's mostly uh, university students. And so it's like being the teacher going to the board game cafe with his students. That's very, it's kind of a strange situation. And um, these two audiences are very, very different and they have a very different relationship to board games. Like uh, core gamers, no designers, no publishers from everywhere in the world. And the young people going to the board game cafes are just going there to uh, create new relationships and because it's very easy to use board games uh, to discuss with people because you don't really have to talk about anything. You have the game in the center of the discussion so you can forget about your shyness and uh, all the difficult social interactions you have in Japan and that's a phenomenon that's been really really uh, surprising me for the past few years and I know that in South Korea, that phenomenon was uh, happened quick, quicker than in Japan, but there was a boom and then it went down and came back to, to the top. And we're just starting to discovering that here in Japan. And that's a very interesting uh, kind of phenomenon in my opinion. I, I don't know how it is in Europe or in uh, Australia, but we have been seeing so many new board game cafes opening every month, less with the, the COVID-19, but still they do operate and uh, people are still going there. And that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon in my, in my opinion. In Belgium, it's, it's the same about uh, the public. Uh, there was so many uh, board game cafe that opened. Uh, less with the pandemic so but uh, the i think the public is not the same at all that uh, in the um, the games evening maybe uh, jean emmanuel uh, can uh, talk about it 
because the, the public is so different and in board game cafes, it's just uh, more uh, party games, like you said. But um, I visit some uh, board game cafe in Copenhagen or something. And this one was uh, specific because there was um, many different rooms uh, and uh, one or two with uh, uh, core board games uh, for hardcore gamer. Mm. Uh, so I don't know, but in Belgium, it seems to be more generalist and more party gamers and so on. I've been to the same board game cafe in Copenhagen, <laughs> I think. And I'll be honest, it's the only board game cafe I think I've been to. There are not very many here in Australia, maybe one or two in each very big city. Um, and I, I think the same as Yannick, you know, I feel like I'm a bit too old and a bit too boring to go <laughs> to those public places. Um, I did have an interesting conversation with someone though who said that they're very, very popular for second dates. So the first date people go somewhere and they want to talk. The second date they want to see a little bit more of what that person's like and maybe they don't want to go out drinking or they don't want to go out for another meal. So they go and play a board game instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have the same kind of a situation with uh, young couples going there first because uh, it's very cheap in japan you can spend like three hours for less than 10 bucks and um that's uh the new date place that replaced kind of replaced the zoo and uh, going to the movies and uh, places like that yes yeah, Emmanuel, you wanted to say something uh, i just wanted to react but if you want to continue there is no problem yeah, go ahead uh, go ahead uh, so my reaction was uh what was really interesting when you presented it into the uh, board game uh, studies which was uh, another conference uh, earlier uh uh, last month, uh, was that uh, the, the use of this board game cafe, in, in it appears right here with a, a, first, a, a second date, is that uh, it's a place where people can socialize with their groups, with their um, uh, people they already know. So it's different from uh, hobbyist ga gamers who go to gaming evenings and things like that to encounters other passionate uh, people other people who share the same hobby, but people who go to board game cafe are different. And what was interesting for me is that the question is from that, is that, okay, we have uh, gaming evenings for uh, hobbies, club activities, etc. We have board game cafe for people with their friends, with their dates, with sometimes their family, but it's more rare, if I remember correctly your presentation. Mm. And what about uh, um, social context, social work, youth activities, etc. In which field do they, they enter? Because they are kind of sort of club activity uh, because these people will go regularly to the same place. So it's different from board game cafe, but at the same time, it's not for people who are passionate about games. So what we are curious about is what uh, that will lead to, what, what context uh, that, uh, that generates. And what is really interesting is that uh, we have the same game can be played at a different place. And at each place, the context will be different. The way to socialize around will be different. The um, goal and social, um, as a world in French with social uh, enjeu, uh, if someone can help Thanks. me. Uh, <laughs> takes, thanks you. Yeah. So social takes are totally different uh, there. So. That's really interesting to, to, to explore. And so if you have some insights on this, if not, I will switch to the next probes. Uh... Um, I think, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand well what you, you were asking me, but um, what I could add for the board game cafes uh, phenomenon is that, um, like, like I said, it's a cheap way of, um, Cheap way. It's not a very nice way to say things, but uh, it's kind of a cheap place to have a date with, uh, like for couples. It's very easy to make to meet new people that you are su supposedly thinking as friends, but you don't really have a lot of um, uh, things you can discuss about, like serious things that you would discuss with uh, really really deep friends, and because. Um, I, I don't know how rude that can sound, but uh, there's a lot of students who have as a goal to get as many friends as they can, like having hundreds of people in their phones and um, 
that's very common here. So places like board game cafes where you just have to sit, wait for someone who's going to explain the rules instead of you reading the rules, which is a very um, painful process when you're not used to playing games. And uh, being able to spend like two, three, four hours with people that you don't really know about, but you will keep a good, good memories because you're going to take a few pictures with them and it's going to feed your Instagram and uh, all this stuff. Uh, I think that's part of the phenomenon. And one, one more interesting I think that um, started to show up with the um, phenomenon of board game cafes is that even designers nowadays are inspired by this phenomenon and are trying to create games that will work especially for board game cafes and big groups of young people. So you will have like one single page of rules with mechanics taken from other very famous games because here we can kind of use other people's games and uh, nobody cares and um, create a new uh, package, new world uh, around the mechanics. And it's, it's um, uh, I don't know how to say that, but it's kind of making the um, created board games quality going down because so many people are trying to copy what is actually already successful. And um, maybe uh, we can talk later about the, the game I, uh, I, I used to, uh, for tonight, but uh, that's the perfect example of what kind of the kind of games that are being created right now to satisfy all the people going to board game cafes that might at some point in their life buy board games, very light board games. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I'm not really answering what you were asking me, Jean Emmanuel, but uh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I have something else not related, to, <laughs> but, uh, but still uh, about game design and something. And uh, where the, the board, uh, in fact, uh, something stuck with me uh, that uh, Etienne Mineur, uh, hybrid uh, board game uh, designer and publisher, said that uh, he, he took the screen and then put it on the table. So the screen is not between uh, the, the players, uh, but on the table. So the interaction is totally different. So I, I think it, it is relatable here. Uh, why we are uh, around the, the board or the card or something, and uh, what uh, is uh, created uh, in uh, the, the 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 board is uh, like um, the the glue between uh, everybody. Uh, I think so. Uh, the unknown people or known people. Uh, so, I think I think it's uh, very uh, interest instructive. Okay, so I think I will go to the next probe, which is about game literacy. If uh, So maybe I will read uh, out loud uh, the quote. So literacy practice are embedded in social contexts and social relationships, sorry, and they involve forms of social action that have social purpose and consequences. It also means recognizes how different social groups have different kinds of access to literacy and how access and distribution are related to broader inequalities within society. So this quote is from uh, an article about game literacy uh, by Buckingham and Byrne. Um, and I selected this quote because it was answering the two main points we already had, which is that uh, there is a discrepancy between uh, various group of people inside the same culture and also outside. If you have any insights, again, uh, I'll let the floor. Um. I've got two things this reminds me of. The first one is actually from the first session of this conference um, with people from um, Staffordshire University and I think it was, um, and the team from, I think it was the University of Witwatersrand in, in South Africa. And they were saying their game design students would get their parents to play test the games that they had designed and that's something that the parents were really happy to do but the parents invariably said wow that's really complex that game you've designed is really difficult and that kind of reflects that I suppose lack of familiarity with with games and picking up to the comment about trick-taking games not everybody knows 
what a trick-taking game is anymore. Um, the other thing that I'd, I would touch on here is um, Liberman did some really interesting research where he had students buy a game in shrink, bring it into his lab and play the game in front of him. Uh, or I think they actually recorded the sessions. And he said in 10 years, not one single group of students, university students, not one single group of students read all the rules before they gave up and said, this is too difficult, let's just play. And, you know, I've done the same. I've had some of my students kind of bring groups into our lab to see what happened. And, you know, we had a group last year, for instance, who were playing Carcassonne. Now for, for us, probably for everybody watching too, you go, oh yeah, that's a really easy game. They missed a couple of key rules like that you pick up your piece after you score a tile and they were really confused and they found this game terribly difficult and they they said to me why would you want to play something that's as difficult as that and I feel like that teaches us something about when we're going out and talking to people about games we need to look for absolutely the most simple games and maybe going back to what we spoke about earlier games that they recognize as a game, games that feel like something that they've played in the past and introducing new concepts, maybe one step at a time. I think that there's a um, good game uh, for Illustrate a Gateway uh, board game is uh, Quirkel. Um, so this is a, a game uh, when you have to place uh, tiles uh, to score. But uh, it's a uh, very, very uh, um, close to Scrabble. Uh, so you have to put the tile and make something. And this is not a word, but uh, this is a, a, like a, a following uh, figure. And uh, people are just, uh, oh, OK, it's like Scrabble. So it's OK for me to play. Uh, so I think this kind of board games is uh, very interesting uh, to initiate people to go further in the hobby. Maybe uh, a quick remark about uh, how to to speak about game literacy uh, within the, that field of social or youth work, uh, which I think is really interesting, and I have I still have no answer is how these these uh, uh, professionals from this field how they they uh, deal actually with game literacy while they are actually. Pursuing other goals uh, when using uh, when using games, for example, they, they want to use games for uh, group building, uh, for social inclusion, to discuss some I don't know is issues about about uh, uh, environment maybe, and at the same time they have to deal with problems really linked with their with their tools, their tools being games, and this. Uh, maybe negotiation between game literacy on one side and another kind of literacy on the other side is very interesting. And I, uh, from the beginning of the work we did on it, I think there are actually maybe two big options. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, as Melissa said, to concentrate on really like basic games or well-known games or basic uh, basic um, uh, mechanisms, um, and on the on the other side to go for more uh, for less known games or for more original games, and to in order to say okay everyone is going to have a low literacy on that game and maybe we can start uh, with having uh, everyone on the same level. But it's just a, a thought about the beginning of the project. Maybe it's going to contradict my, my view. I think that's a good point. Something that I've come to think about is that, and, and I hate saying this, right? And I, I hate saying it particularly to other people who love games, but maybe it doesn't matter if the game is any good. Maybe it doesn't matter if what we're teaching someone is a really rubbish game, if it gets them behaving the way that, we, we want to encourage if it gets them having conversations, if it gets them thinking about something that's important, maybe it doesn't matter if all they're doing is rolling dice and moving. And I'm interested in what the rest of you think about that because I, I kind of hate myself a bit for saying that. 
the muted moderator in the other room just shouted, yes, exactly that, exactly that. Uh, Jean-Emmanuel, I think we, we have a, a probe in the in the chat, so uh, maybe it's time to, uh, yeah, to I go just for saw it. That, and it was just the time for the white card, so it's exactly the good timing. Uh, so let's just, I have to find back the... Yeah, because, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna read okay, it if you, you want. So thank you, Melissa, for <laughs> bringing it uh, into the chat. So uh, the, this comment or probe was the rule book is really important for how uh, approachable a game is, which is kind of contradictory to what uh, uh, Yannick, I think, uh, no, Melissa said, but uh, it's an interesting uh, view. So let's react on them. I, I think that this is uh, it's uh, real because uh, there are uh, a, an enterprise uh, named Diced. I don't know if uh, any of you uh, know it, but uh, it it take uh, it takes game and then uh, make the rules and uh, audiovisual uh, uh, form. So with uh, with interaction and with uh, image and, and so on and so you can take the the box and just uh, launch the app and you have just to follow uh, the the rules. So I can't say if uh, the a complex game is uh, is very um, playable uh, this way because I just uh, try a King Domino, so it's a, a little game. Uh, but it's uh, very, very uh, practical, I think, and uh, it's uh, it's he, he, they hope to make money uh, with it. So I think they hope that there are market uh, for it. Yeah, if I can react on that, because uh, I, I think when when we start looking around, like um, Dice is a good example, but you have people making. Uh, rule explanations as a video on the internet, like people like watch it played and people like that. It's like everybody's trying to get rid of the rule book, actually. So we, in a very magical world, we will be able to play games without knowing actually how the, the game works. And when, when you think of it, I, I remember watching a, a few video explanations of game rules and I'm pretty sure that for people who are not used to the word, the wording used in most rule books, they won't even understand the explanation that's been made in video. So it just it just replaces the laziness of people going through the rule book as a book that you have to read, which is a very good thing because sometimes uh, you feel like you could miss something when you read because you could lose concentration, you could have like people around you, people speaking to you. And yet when you uh, give a lot of trust to people who are actually doing exactly the same thing with way more work behind, way more, uh, a bigger need of concentration, they make a lot of mistakes often. Like you, you, you look at someone like Rado, he's making mistakes all over the place every time. So if you trust a video like that, you will, you will lose. I mean, you will miss a lot of key mechanisms in, and key rules in the game. So uh, that, that's something very difficult because you can see that some people are trying to create solutions so that we can get rid of the rule books and yet you have to go through the rule books. And yes, that's a pain for most people, especially if you have to read like 30 pages of rules with a special word, uh, wording and a very difficult, um, what is it, specialized voc vocabulary to understand. I, I don't see any solution. And that's, I think something that has been very uh, efficient in France, when I look at my friends in France who discovered board games recently, is that they just play games with people who know games and that these people will explain the games, they will make mistakes, they will lose most of the first games they play, but still, if they are in the, the right environment and having fun playing the games, because it becomes a social, socializing tool, they will come back at it. And it takes a lot of time. I mean, a few months, a few years sometimes for people to buy their first game and go through the 
difficult process of reading the first rule book they have to read in their life because nobody reads the rules for Monopoly. I mean, let's be honest here. And uh, <laughs> that's probably for most people like reaching 30 years old, 40 years old, you start reading the first rule book of a board game. That's pretty interesting. Uh, it's, I guess it's a, a long and difficult process, but if there's no way you can get rid of the rule books like Dyson are trying to make you think about, yeah. So I just want to quickly react because it's one point I, I studied at uh, uh, one time is is that yes indeed people want to get rid of the rule book, <laughs> but at the same time the rule book is is still need to be present as a proof a legal proof to uh, okay we we have both different various interpretation on how things sh should work, let's go back to the rule book, mm -hmm. and what is really interesting is that uh, all transmission is really important uh, in the circulation of games, and you mentioned the monopoly. You no know, one is reading the rules of monopoly, and it's really funny because for Uno or monopoly, uh, a lot of uh, local tradition uh, uh, started to spread really really deeply in, in various places. I think there should be a geographic or familial um, study about how this, uh, how this house rule uh, uh, have, are diffused among a population. For example, one example for Monopoly is uh, if you go to um, the parking lot uh, case, what happened? In the rules, nothing. Uh, for a lot of people, you, various things happen when you go to the parking lot. Uh, so that's really interesting. And, and one case of ours was also the Uno on Twitter. Someone asked, OK, what happened? Uh, can someone play a plus four on a plus two? And the official rules say no. And it was a scandal. A lot of people are shocked to learn through Twitter that uh, that's not the rules. And when you check, it's 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 on your box. It's on your the, the rule book. It's not really book. It's a paper, but yeah, it's still the same. So uh, that's really an interesting subject. And also, uh, what was really interesting is that there is. Um, kind of people who are here to explain the rules, it's a good way to be introduced to game is to be explain the rules by someone else. And you mentioned the, uh, there is obviously a YouTube video, there's tutorials through uh, gameplay now that some people use to learn the rules uh, when they want to play. Hobbyist gamers do that uh, sometimes to go to a game which is um, digitized to learn on the digitized version because there is a tutorial and then explain the rules to their friends. But it's interesting in our context of social work because that means that the person explaining the rules will have a very huge uh, importance. And I think, if I remember the order correctly, uh, no, I, I think I will just switch the order. If it's yeah, if you if you stay just a little uh, uh, moment, I have an anecdote about it. Okay. <laughs> um, because uh, I um, I worked on a, on a school. Uh, with uh, some uh, some uh, teenagers and they played Uno because uh, they knows it and so uh, every day that was uh, oh hey, we will play Uno but this, there are always a problem with uh, the plus card but uh, can I put a plus card and then a plus card and then a plus card or no and so on and so I was the the people uh, that uh, that uh, bring uh, the games. So they turn uh, towards me to know if the rules uh, was correct or no. And so I said, but you have the game, just so uh, open it and uh, uh, read the, the rules. So they are, ah, oh, yes, oh, maybe we could do that and so on. And so I just put uh, the, the legit uh, the legit part of the, of the rules back because they don't say it like that, that was me. Uh, the um, the part uh, was the was the um, the solution, so it's uh, it was very interesting uh, to to do that and not uh, to uh, continue uh, the um, my role uh, in this, but uh, just uh, to uh, back off of it. I just want to read two comments from the chat, uh, which are related to that to that question. The first one is like a piece of advi uh, advice uh, saying that Diamonds uh, from Stronghold Games uh, has one of the best rule books uh, for teaching trick-taking games to somebody who has never played one. So if you want to go for, uh, for a game 
with people uh, not used to playing, then maybe use that one. And uh, another comment uh, from the chat is that uh, someone is saying that any rule book that me needs me to read all the way to the end before starting touching the, the pieces is going to stay in the box on the shelf. Uh, and this person have, has to, to uh, work through the steps while touching things. And uh, she, she or, or he uh, describes it, uh, of describes uh, himself, herself as a kinetic learner. So, uh, which is also um, uh, important when we think about uh, uh, conceiving new games, creating new games. Okay, if it's fine with everyone, I will switch quickly to, uh, so not the next one, but I will just switch because there is an interesting subject we can uh, navigate through. And also, quick question, uh, Dr. Maha Alad, Alad, I don't know, Haladat, uh, if it, if you correctly, uh, if you want to participate, you, you can since you are in the Zoom chat, so if you want to interject and have something to share, feel free uh, to, uh, to join us. So, uh, quick uh, switch to uh, something for more field work. Uh, I will let uh, Bruno maybe uh, read uh, that because he's the one who collected it. Of course. So that was uh, a part of a telephone interview report. So it's not a, a literal um, uh, quote, but it's a quote, it's still a quote. So uh, youth worker was remarking that she does not use uh, board games herself. Uh, she says in our organization, there is a part of the, uh, uh, this organization is part of a network in which there are uh, game or toys, uh, toy libraries. And hence she considers the toy librarians as specialists and she turns, or she always turns to them for activities involving board games. And I was thinking about this quote because it seems to be a kind of professionalization of uh, people using board games um, in uh, youth work. And I thought it was interesting for you to comment on it. So and maybe Virginie, you, you could react on that because it's part of, of your yes, own uh... activity. As a toy uh, librarian, uh, there are so many uh, people that uh, come to the toy library and uh, ask for some help about uh, which uh, game they can play, they can use. Um, but beside that, there are another kind of people, the people that uh, used uh, every time the same game. So uh, all the all all of the years they uh, teach, they uh, every every year they take the same games and uh, I, I uh, we, we uh, add maybe uh, 6,000 uh, games in the uh, toy library but that was uh, too much there was no place to uh, to move and so we uh, just in one year uh, we just uh, uh, throw um, maybe half of it so uh, this kind of people, when they come, they don't uh, find uh, the, the games anymore. So uh, I just can to, uh, be uh, again the, the person who can uh, help them. Uh, so I said, yes, but if you want to do that, maybe this game is better, uh, you can use it and something. And so I have to ask them when they uh, come back and say that the, the game was, uh, was all right for you. Yeah, yes, that was so good. Uh, because the, uh, at the first time they were, they were oh no, but uh, this game was so good. Uh, this, uh, the, that is so a pity. Uh, but uh, I said, yes, but uh, may, now there are maybe no, 1,200 uh, games uh, Year that uh, that comes out, so maybe you could just uh, just uh, dig a little, but uh, they they have to have somebody to uh, to help them to do that. So uh, I think uh, toy librarians as a good uh, good way to good people to do it. Uh, if you allow it, I will do just a quick in interjection. So, Mr. Lomami. Uh, could connect uh, right now. So just to uh, say to him, uh, there is a transcript of, uh, because he has a translator, 
Donc, Monsieur Lamamy, il y a une, une version française de votre, du texte que l'on a mis, euh, auquel vous pouvez lire en dessous, et on va attendre que vous ayez pu le, tra le traduire. Et lorsque vous voulez, vous pouvez euh, intervenir et participer. So back to English, and if someone wants to react to what uh, Virginie Tax said, uh, let's continue the discussion. I'll jump in. In Australia, toy libraries tend to be run by volunteers. And very differently, I think, from in Europe, they tend to be for very young children only. And so once people's children maybe turn five, they tend to stop going to the toy library. And one of our local toy libraries started to buy some board games for families to play and for the older children in those families um, to play with their parents. And um, the, the president of that toy library said to me, and then people started asking us, do you have any two player games that we can play after the children have gone to bed? And it's very, very new here to have, um, to have this, but they've now started to have members who don't have young children who are just joining the toy library to buy games. And I can see somebody is asking about toy libraries. So in the Australian context, they're a community organisation. You pay a small amount of money, I think about 30 Australian dollars, probably 20 US each year to be a member of the toy library. And that allows you to borrow toys take them home for your child to play with for two weeks or a month and then bring them back and swap them over. Um, and so usually here it's, you know, big toy cars or um, sets of, of children's Lego rather than board games. Is it, is it a similar arrangement over there? Um, no, we have uh, everything. So we have... Uh... We have pedagogical games, we have toys, we have board games from just uh, two, two years old to, to uh, maybe 18 years old, uh, depends on the theme. Uh, but I think it is a very uh, interpelling that uh, the, 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 um, the word in English is toy library, not game library. So uh, it is, uh, it's creates something in, in, in the mind that, uh, okay, this is just uh, toys and this is just for uh, for uh, little uh, ones and something. And uh, I just want to add that uh, in my toy library, uh, when you, you enter it, uh, the, your site were just, uh, was just uh, on the toys. And so the, there was people that come and then see all the toys and then back off. So we just uh, have changed that to put uh, some uh, eight family games at the inter um, to, for people to, to see that they're not just toys, but board games too, so they can stay and, uh, and see. Maybe a quick reaction to uh, is that what is really interesting is that uh, all the time the main question was access. Uh, access to access to the rules and access to the game, uh, either through a place where they feel legitimate to participate. Uh, the quote here is about legitimacy to how to explain, how about transmission of the rules once again, uh, because you have to know the games to be able to transmit them. And that's really interesting because um, I think it's the same for the YouTube video of uh, game explanation. There is also professionalization in this field, uh, either through YouTube money and things like that, or because uh, there are some editors who pay people to produce videos with QR codes where you can uh, view the YouTube video to learn the rules and not just have to go through the books. And the same for the... Um, the anecdote uh, Virgin Tact uh, told us about the uh, young uh, people playing, you know, who asked her because she has the legitimacy as someone who is a Tory librarian who is here to explain. Uh, so they ask her. Um, so they ask her about how, what do you do? What do we do now? And that's really interesting because I think that's something we will have to, we will have some testimony, we will, 
we already have one uh, right now about how um, people give access to games and give access to uh, specific forms of gaming, uh, not the ones they already know, but other forms. So I think it's a, it's an interesting point. We will have to maybe dig a, a little further. If someone wants to react. Uh, a 10 minute warning. Okay. I have one quick story. Um, my, my daughter does babysitting, right? She looks after um, children and one family that she babysits for has two daughters who are five and seven. And every time she goes to babysit, she packs a bag with games and she takes them over to play with the children while she's babysitting. She's very popular because of this. But um, she babysat for a new family and... Um, and then they asked her to come back a month later they were going out again and she, so she packed some different games to take over and she arrived and she must be the most expensive babysitter ever because they had gone out the day after she babysat their children and bought rhino hero and king domino and one other game that she had taken over and then they would bought two other games that they saw in the shop and they'd put them on the shelf to wait until the next time she came to babysit so that she could teach those games to their children and they could learn to play them from their children. So, you know, games that we would think were very simple, they didn't even dare to try to, to approach the rules. They wanted to get a professional or someone with experience to teach them the game. Okay, so if there is no further reaction, I think since we have a little time, we have two suggestions for the last prompt. We can take one from the chat if someone has a suggestion. Uh, no, there is not. Okay. And the other possibility is either to go to the question of creation of games or to go to uh, the question of inclusion or exclusion. Which choice do you want? Uh, if someone wants to, okay, I will do. Uh, then we we'll go to creation of games. So uh, if someone wants to react to this uh, model, so maybe uh, Virginie Tack uh, explain why she selected yes, it. Uh, well, that was um, a frame that uh, um, the has uh, been presented in the board game studies uh, colloquium. And uh, that was about uh, the teacher, why teachers uh, use, uh, use board games. But I think we can broad it uh, to uh, why workers will uh, use board games uh, or maybe why they will not uh, use board games. So uh, I think maybe we could uh, discuss uh, the um, the characteristic here maybe is this a working framework or the worker personality but maybe we could say uh, worker games literacy uh, too uh, some uh, problematic situation or something that uh, the worker want to uh, work about and uh, what contexts will be uh, favorable uh, toward game design and innovation so maybe it's uh, um, um, if we have to have uh, all of the, um, the characteristic to, uh, to uh, begin to use uh, board games or no, but maybe you have uh, some uh, kind of uh, anecdote or experience about uh, this to, to share with us. Uh, can I comment on that? Uh, I, I, I don't know, um, as the first time I see uh, of this uh, uh, what is it picture, and um, what I, I know that I, I'm teaching French with my university students, and uh, I've been trying to use board games sometimes on very rare occasions to uh, teach something very particular, like numbers in French or dates. How you say dates in French with a given timeline, for example, but. These games were not created as educative tools uh, to begin with. To, to be, begin with. I've, I'm just using them as uh, 
fun ways of learning French, uh, especially with numbers and all the, the uh, beautiful exceptions we have in uh, how we say numbers, especially in uh, Francis French. And, uh, <laughs> but every time, I, 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 I think it's very hard to be um, making games as an educator because like some of my game designers friends would say, game designing is a job and something that you need to train a long, long time to be good at. And most, most game designers won't do games with uh, educational goals in mind, which could be interesting. I'd like to see Antoine Boza do educational games. I don't think it will work on that, but uh, I'd like to see that at some point in history. And um, I, I don't know, as, as a teacher, I try not to use too much board games because uh, I get the feeling that my students, especially in Japan, uh, will think that I'm not actually doing my job and just having fun with them. And sometimes I try to explain why I use like timeline to teach big numbers and how to use uh, like dates in French. And uh, it's still very hard to convince them that we are actually studying French when I do that. So it's, I feel I'm always on a very dangerous uh, lane that could lead me to some complaints from my students. So I don't know, I, I feel it's, I feel like from my personal experience in Japan, I feel like it's very difficult to first as an educator to make a good game that will be efficient as an educational tool, but also well-designed and since I'm a gamer, I don't want to do a very bad game just because I have a, a goal with uh, how I want to teach French. And as a game designer, I don't think most game designers have goals like education in mind when we create. They're just creating what they feel like could be a good experience as a game experience, not a teaching experience. So I'm it's a very difficult question to answer for me right now. I'm just in the bill. I'm a core gamer, but I never talk about board games with my students. It's just on very rare occasions. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what to think about the, 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 the four criteria we have here and just how to be right in the middle seems to be a very difficult thing to me. Yeah. Uh. Maybe one point you, from what you said is that uh, on this uh, schematic, there is a missing part, which is the students' uh, uh, approach to games and students' mm -hmm. game literacy and students' receptions to, to games. Uh, that is also important because uh, even if uh, the teacher is interested in games, maybe not uh, especially the students, but that's one point that I, I retained from your presentation and also here we have a case of a worker personality, uh, a teacher personality, who influenced uh, and the specific problems, uh, specific mm -hmm. points you want to teach, but influence the creation. So it's not a working framework, it's not a favorable context. Uh, who, uh, mm -hmm. how, how to say it? Who helped that? It's really your own initiative and passion about games. And mm -hmm. but it's also what is interesting is also what limits you to use. Uh, board game because all, you also know that creating a good board game is not that easy. I, I think there is no missing part here because a favorable context uh, is a part of it. So maybe if uh, Yannick said that the, the context is not favorable, so it doesn't uh, apply here. Or maybe we could say it's the framework that it uh, doesn't uh, uh, is good enough uh, to, to use uh, that. So I don't know if uh, if they, that's invalid the the model here, but I think there is so much to dig uh, about uh, this uh, this model. If someone wants to add anything, if not, I think we'll close here. Uh, yeah, uh, just maybe one side remark about the worker's personality. It's really, uh, really something I've se uh, I've seen uh, in my own practice, because I, I'm working uh, as a as a trainer for for future uh, youth workers, and during trainings there is uh, there is uh, always 
a person, one person actually coming with the games and everybody, everybody knows that's this person and he or she's going to come with the games and entertain the, the rest of the group. And it's uh, almost a tradition, actually, that that we know at the beginning of the week that, that uh, this person will come with seven games for seven days, uh, for example, and each day uh, he's going to explain the next game to, to the people there and nobody, uh, no, no other pe uh, person in the group is going to take over that, uh, uh, that role. So it's uh, really a kind of tradition, I think. Uh, which made me think about an anecdote that I just had with uh, one of the conversation I had, uh, which is more to connected to what uh, Yannick De Platt said. It was uh, so it's a social worker, but it's more uh, is uh, is not a person who is directly in contact with the youth. Is more someone who is uh, in a social work activity, but to form uh, other social work and study how they work, etc. And he told me that uh, for his formation and when he's teaching formation, uh, since he's also a, a, a gamers on the side, he's also saying that, no, we don't use board games. We use things who looks like board games, but it, since it's pedagogical, it's not board games. And I was quite surprised because he knew was, I was here to integrate about board games. And when I asked, okay, do you use board games? We, 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 uh, we already knew someone told me that, yeah, he's using games in his fieldwork. I asked him, do you use board games? Say no. I was like, okay, uh, so uh, there is something not uh, not fitting here. <laughs> and so when I, I dig a little and say, no, no, we use pedagogical games, but it's not board game. It's the same thing, same presentation. Sometimes it's even uh, adapted uh, commercial board games, but uh, uh, it's not the same thing. And it also told me that uh, for some people in the social work activity, they don't want to use commercial board games because it's commercial and it's uh, on the opposite side of the value of social work, which uh, some of them are against uh, the idea of using commercial things and uh, things like that. So they don't want to uh, use directly uh, commercial board games, but they are open to the idea to use other kinds of games which are, can be related uh, as long as it's not commercial. So I don't know if someone wants to react to that. If not, uh, I think we'll stop here. We are already over time. I would like to take reactions over to the Discord if possible. Good idea. So I think we'll close here. Thank you for listening for the, I don't know how many uh, people followed us. Um, uh, and uh, if someone wants to say the final word, because I don't have any ID suddenly. <laughs> yeah, maybe thank you to, to you all for being there. So uh, from uh, Emprage, but also uh, to Melissa and to Yannick. And thank you to uh, Bradley Tabletop Game Symposium for hosting this uh, this event. I think we, we're going to stay, I'm going to stay in contact with you all, uh, because there, there, there are a lot of topics uh, which could not uh, uh, be uh, talked about. So uh, maybe you're going to receive a little mail from me in the next days. Thank you for having us. This was great. And thanks everyone for watching. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.